Welcome, everybody, to Marloop Church. I hope your new year is starting off well. Today we're going to continue our series on the parable of winter by looking at the theology of ice. And we do that because in this community we believe that ice was God's idea. God created water with the capacity to freeze. God made H2O molecules in such a way that when the temperature drops and the energy decreases, the molecules slow down and they kind of spread out as though at arm's length and then they bond to each other in what's called a crystal lattice, which is liquid water becoming ice. And because those H2RO molecules kind of spread out when they become a solid, they actually are less dense than the water, the liquid water from which they came which is why ice floats. Now I'm laughing now because sitting on my counter at home is a cup that I was gonna have ice in and then a jar with some water and I was gonna pour it in and show you all that ice floats. Fran's going, really, John? <laughs> I think people know after Christmas and all of those beverages that ice floats so you don't have to uh, do that thing. You have no idea how much she saves you from stuff on Sunday mornings, just like that. <laughs> Anyway, ice floats because it's less dense in its solid form. And if you do know a little bit about ice or you teach science to your class like Dirk does, that's a bit of a miracle because most elements, when they become in, move into their solid form, they're heavier and they sink to the bottom. But with water, it's the other way around. And so that's called the density anomaly. What a call to worship. We got to density anomaly in the, in the welcome. Anyway, that's really important. We're going to talk about that more later on. Um, but as we begin our service on the theology of ice, um, that's the theological perspective that we're coming from. That's why we would do this. So ice was God's idea. The density anomaly and other characteristics of ice that we're going to talk about, they are evidence of the thoughts of God, of the wisdom of God making ice in its iceness. And God made ice that way for a reason. So what? What is the reason, God? And what does the reason say about who you are? And then lastly, in this community, we believe if we look at all of this, at ice this way, with eyes like that, we can even potentially see a reflection of the face of God in the nature of ice. Okay, before we step into all of that, we'll start with an opening prayer and then a snowy icy song and then another song couple songs and then uh, we'll get into the theology of ice more so please join me in a prayer i can hear the old hymn sung in the old church uh, that i grew up in lord this is our father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. Uh, creation is something through which you speak, God. And, and what we scraped off our car windshields this morning, maybe some of us, is indeed a kind of text that says something about your mind, about the mind of the maker of all things. And so as we engage that wintry, frozen, slippery text this morning, we pray that we would see your face reflected there and your thinking and uh, your love and your providence. So meet us in those ways uh, by a work of your Holy Spirit, the only way anybody can ever see you or engage the mystery of you. Um, move by your spirit in Jesus name, we pray. Amen. This week, I uh, read a psalm just in my morning devotions, as I always read psalms early in the morning, and uh, this phrase caught my attention. The world is established, firm, and secure. And as I read those words, I guess I'd been thinking about, in the previous days, all of this uh, environmental weight of ice caps melting in the Arctic and Antarctic, and uh, felt a little bit of that weight lifting. The, the world is established, John, firm and secure. 
The, the Arctic and Antarctic, you've no doubt seen in the news, they're the world's refrigerator, right? They are, because that ice is there, uh, there is equilibrium and stasis in terms of the global climate. And uh, when those ice caps melt, um, we get into big, big trouble. So ice is God's way of regulating the temperature of the earth, of keeping you and I uh, comfortably cool. Anyway, I read that verse and I was comforted by that thought and just meditating on it, said to myself, yeah, you've got this, God. This is your planet. The world belongs to you and everything in it. And you're not going to let it go. Uh, Environmentally, you're not going to let it go. You've promised to keep and sustain your creation. And you always keep your promises, God. That doesn't mean we get a pass on our ecological sins. doesn't mean we become that kind of church that figures we're just supposed to use it all until it all burns up and then God will make a brand new one. Bad theology there. We do have to change our ways. But it was a comfort in the face of carrying the fact that we do have to change our ways. God's providential power is greater than our environmental capacity to sin. Thousands of years ago, uh, after a huge environmental calamity, a massive flood, God made this promise to Noah. While the earth remains, sea time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. And for our purposes today, while the earth remains, ice shall not cease. Even though we misbehave, even though we mess up, manage to cause what we are now causing on this planet, God keeps his world going on all kinds of levels. But this morning, even at the subatomic and the atomic level, right down to the ever-faithful molecular nature of H2O. The, The nature of ice is evidence of God's providence. From whom, from whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens? God asked Job. Water becomes like Water becomes hard like stone, and the surface of the deep is imprisoned. The breath of God produces ice, and the broad waters become frozen. And No, not in an old man winter, God blowing in that image that's in your head, and everything freezes as a result, or frozone from that animated cartoon. But more in a world engineering hydrologically-minded, let's make the H2O molecule so that it can exist in all the ways it does, so that ice can form in all the ways it does, so that the world can work in all the ways it does, kind of way. The breath of God produces ice. Ice that in its solid form, as I said in the introduction, is less dense than liquid water and therefore floats. Which is, I read this week, an important feature in Earth's biosphere. It has been argued that without this property, natural bodies of water would freeze, in some cases permanently, from the bottom up resulting in a loss of bottom-dependent animal and plant life in fresh and sea water. Sufficiently thin ice sheets allow light to pass through while protecting the underside from short-term weather extremes, such as wind chill. And this creates a sheltered environment for bacterial and algal colonies. When seawater freezes, The ice is riddled with brine-filled channels which sustain sympagic organisms such as bacteria, algae, copepods, and annelids, which in turn provide food for animals such as krill and specialized fish like the bald nodothan, fed upon in turn by larger animals such as emperor penguins and minke whales, and you get the idea. Us at the top of the food chain although I haven't had a lot of minke whale in my life. Any of you? 
Nobody, somebody online's raising their hand or something. Yeah, me, no, we did. All of that is enabled to happen in arguably the best and right way because ice floats, because of the density anomaly. What Dirk said to me this week was the miracle of water. And I don't know that I was thinking miracle every time I used ice over the last few weeks. I was thinking it a little bit more as I scraped it off my windshield this morning. And not only does ice float, but it flows, I learned from Bernie Takama, an expert on ice from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans here in Canada. He said to me a whole bunch of things, and I'll give you a few of those things now. Ice flows downhill in the form of glaciers, most of the time very slow, but sometimes galloping at 100 meters per year. That's a uh, scientist joke, I think. But it did make me wonder when he said those words, if ice ages are God's way of adjusting the macro environmental thermostat for this planet that belongs to him every once in a while. God knows the earth from beginning to end. God's sense of time is way different and above our sense of time. And urgency is above our sense of urgency. A thousand days are like a day to God, the biblical writer writes. And sometimes God moves in glacial ways, gallops alone in glacial ways. But the Lord, as Peter wrote in the New Testament, is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you. And we always hear that verse from the New Testament in terms of our faith and our spirituality and our lives. But what if that's also true? What if the you is also this earth, this broken, failing, falling short, maybe, yes, yeah, certainly to be renewed one day, earth? Even as God is patient with our sinful spirituality and brokenness, God is patient with our sinful spirituality and brokenness in relation to this planet that belongs to him. And I don't want to say this to tick off people who care about this passionately, but I still believe God has something up God's sleeve in terms of something that's been built into this earth that will enable a grace to come to us, even in the face of all that's happening. Takama goes on, ice is what also primarily gives us the rich earth that we have on the prairies. Through grinding away some of the strongest structures we have on earth, rock. So ice took rock and made arable, fertile prairie soil. We'll come back to ice's power in just a minute. Ice, he goes on to say, is what sustains the quality of life of hundreds of millions of people by keeping food from rotting. I'm feeling a lot better about with our new fridge this week, so our food will not rot and that fridge will not finally fail. Well, think about that. Every time you open your freezer, the providential gift of ice enabling food not to rot and fail so that you can have life and sustenance, a gift from God. And ice and snow at high altitudes acts as reservoirs for the dry times of the year when rain does not fall in sufficient quantities to water our crops, forests, keep our fish alive in our rivers, etc. Now you're remembering, if you were here, that sermon on mountain geology and mountain tops being buckets of water. When that ice melts, we have water into August here in the prairies. So, just a short list of what ice is and what ice does, but where would we be without God's gift, God's ever-wise thought to make ice? They, all of that makes you just want to get on your knees and thank you, say thank you, God, for what you've given us in ice. I'm thinking we might more pray the opposite prayer. <laughs> God, ice, you know, but... But where would we be without this very necessary reality? Your righteousness, God, is like the highest mountains. Your justice, like the great deep. You preserve both people and animals and planets. 
through the provision of ice. Another interesting characteristic of ice is how it expands. Um, when water freezes, roughly 9% expansion in volume for fresh water. And we all know and have heard stories and seen news stories of the power of that expansion, 9%, because these little H2O molecules are made the way they are, do what they do when they form a crystal lattice which is why I freaked out last week on the coldest of our cold last two weeks of days when the pipe on the exterior wall going up to our bathroom froze and right so we had no cold water upstairs and I'm going, oh my word, when this thaws, what's going to happen? A copper pipe is nothing to, to the freezing power of ice. Ice lifts houses, which is why we build foundations so far down. It splits rocks makes soil, damages shorelines. And all of that uh, makes me think and wonder if God, is it, could it be that your providence is most powerfully and effectively and, and all the time at work in the smallest of ways through a molecular bond, through H2O, working in this way, bringing about your goodness and care and provision in the world. Could could providence be working at that sub, sub atomic level? God's already thought that through in terms of what we would need to have this. Even as H2O molecules lock into a crystal lattice, God has established the earth. God holds his creation in place. God holds your life in place. As surely as ice forms, when we hit zero degrees Celsius, Fahrenheit and Celsius. Whoa, I'm a true Canadian now. I've forgotten the Fahrenheit I grew when I was a kid, learned when I was a kid. But even as that surely will happen when water reaches the freezing temperature, God has you, your family, your kids, your life. You're the one God, you alone, you made the heavens, the heavens, the heavens of heavens and all angels, the earth and everything on it, the seas and everything in them, you keep them all alive. And one last characteristic of ice, and uh, this connects to our skating party next week, which I'll get into in just a sec, is its capacity to melt. Melting enables ice to cool its surroundings, according to Darren Brower, a chemistry professor from Redeemer University that I talked to. I think I always aim too high when I ask questions, like I pro probably could ask, you know, a high school student this one and they could answer it, but it helped me, the not so good high school and chemistry student, remember. As ice melts, that probably could all stay in my inside voice, couldn't it? I didn't need to do any of that stuff. As ice melts from solid to liquid, it draws heat from its surroundings. That's what's happening uh, chemistry-wise and consequently causes the surroundings to cool down, which is why we need the ice caps to do that kind of cooling thing uh, for, a, for a while, a long, a long while. Anyway, for our skating party next week, Bonas Park, 11 o'clock, we're going to be starting. We'll gather around a fire. Maybe we'll have the bander there so you can see where the church is, and we're going to have a good time. And even if you don't skate, come on out. Walk on the ice with your boots. If you need to bring your walker, put skates on the walker. You can do this, Joe, right? But let's get together as a community and skate on the text that we're talking about right now. But melting is what makes ice slippery when we do what we're going to do next week. Melting ice is God's gift to all skaters. Less so to my Toronto Maple Leafs last night who lost to Colorado, but still a gift to all skaters. Where would hockey be, Canadians, without ice melting and becoming slippery? But what makes ice slippery? So that was a question I had a while ago. So I spent a whole day doing research trying to find out what the answer to that question is. And at first, I read, scientists thought it was just the pressure of the skate on the ice which caused a thin la layer of water to form, melting to happen. But then they did the math on that, and that, no, is not enough to make that happen. And then other scientists thought it was friction as the skate's blade kind of moves along the ice, therefore, but they did the math on that, and that doesn't work either, not completely. 
And then someone thought it's a combination of the two, and they got a little bit closer to it. And then, in 2004, we've just figured this out, and we've just seen it for what it is. In 2004, Katsuyuki Kawamura performed experiments that led him to conclude that this thin liquid layer is formed due to the reduction of the reduced number of chemical bonds holding the surface molecules in place. Atoms in the outermost surface vibrate with greater amplitude than atoms in the interior solid. Surface melting is attributable to the interaction of the vibrational motion of the surface molecules with the interior of bulk molecules. So I actually got, put the next one up. That picture um, from a scientist who had just published a paper that I tripped on. And, he, and when we talked, he said, hey, do you need some graphics for your sermon? I said, sure, and he sent me this. So this is a, a visualization of what they think is happening, our best understanding of what makes ice slippery. So pressure, friction, and the surface chemical bond thing all playing out together. And this came from a UC Davis article um, that I read, and then I sent an email, uh, or the article said this, and then I'll let you hear what I emailed the researcher. Researchers in Germany and the UN US and Japan have used a combination of experiments and computer modeling to show how this quasi-liquid layer forms as layers of the ice crystal melt. The structure of the surface changes in a stepwise manner corresponding to melting of one or two layers, said David David Donatio, assist, assistant professor of chemistry at the University of California, Davis, and co-author on the study uh, with colleagues led by Alan Backus. Da, 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 da. The quasi-liquid layer appears because while water molecules inside ice are arranged as a crystal lattice, molecules at the surface get disordered trying to maximize the number of hydrogen bonds and can, and can diffuse laterally across the surface, Donatio said. So I was really into it, okay? Maybe not as cool for you right now, but that was so cool when I, I, I thought, we're seeing this, like we're able to actually see something that we've all experienced for so long, and it's been such a mystery for so long. They've solved the mystery, in part, anyway. But then I thought, okay, that's how it happens, but why does it happen? Um, you know, we've all these reasons why ice is beneficial in terms of how it contributes to the world, but how is ice most itself by being slippery and having this capacity uh, within itself? And so that's where I sent an email to David Donatio at UC Davis, because that's what you do when you're researching a sermon on ice. You send an email to the guy who's written the most recent paper on this, and is your best source. And you pray at that point that they'll answer and not go, who is this crazy pastor from Calgary reaching out? So I wrote this. I said, uh, hello, David. After reading last month's UC Davis article on your recently published study, which was fascinating, congratulations. Seems this has been a long sought after explanation. I was left with a question. Why is surface slipperiness a benefit to ice? The presence of ice itself brings so many benefits to our planet, ecosystems. What benefits come to ice through the slipperiness phenomenon you've explained? I'm not sure, I'm not even sure these are science questions, but I thought I'd ask. And so he got back to me that afternoon. These are actually well-posed questions. Thanks. <laughs> I kind of did that at that moment. I went, yeah, thanks. When the scientist says it, right? It's well-posed. Uh, I'm going to get struck down right now. This is what happens. Preacher pride creeps in. From a scientific perspective, one may change them a little in the direction of what are the consequences of ice having such surface structure. We are investigating some of the chemical consequences as there are evidences that the particular structure of ice surfaces may favor certain chemical reactions in the atmosphere. Okay, so it's connected that way. At our altitudes, instead, there may be consequences as of how ice in glaciers and or sea ice absorb ions, which are then determining how ice melts, how glaciers slide, and ultimately bear effects on life. I don't have a clear idea how, though. 
Unfortunately, I am too much, I'm not too much into the biological side of the story, and a lot of what I mentioned is hypothesis and work in pro progress. In any case, I'm giving you more open questions than answers, but I hope this helps. Wish you all your best, all the best in your sermon. And it, it was that we think we're now just beginning to see that, that that phenomenon of those bonds being the way they are at the surface and ice melting, that that has a profound connection to the atmosphere. But we don't really know, and he, like all good scientists, we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> but that there is a link to me was such a profound truth. I mean, of course there is, but that we're beginning to see something that we hadn't seen before and understand the nature of nature in ice as it relates to the rest of the world in ways that are arguably going to surprise us and maybe delight us in terms of how they offer a corrective when things get a little too hot. Who, I mean, who knows what we don't know yet in terms of how God's providence will play out in that place all because of those disordered bonds happening at the surface as ice does what ice does when ice melts and the way ice melts. So you can know that next week as you strap on a pair of skates and move across the ice because the ice is doing what the ice is made to do. That that same phenomenon has something to do with the atmosphere and the larger thing that God is holding, has made, is, is promising, has promised to keep as sure as the world holds together. You will hold together. I've got you, your family, your life, your body, your fears. In the same way that we can know that ice is working in the nature, its very nature for our good, we can know that God is working for our good. And I can know what I was forced to memorize as a little boy in the Heidelberg Catechism, that it's true that God also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. All things. And again, we always think, we spiritualize it. It's our relationships, it's our prayer, it's our... But all ice things are working together for our salvation and the cosmos' salvation. C.S. Lewis, I've read this a few times, but once said, every created thing is in its degree an image of God and the ordinate and faithful appreciation of that thing a clue which truly followed will lead back to God. And that is what we've just done in some small 30-minute way is looked at that thing that God made that is ice and really have, I believe, for me, seen a reflection of his thinking, of his love, of his providence, of his care, of his icy goodness. Please join me in a prayer, and then we're going to sing in response. Because you have to sing in response. Are we going to sing that creation song in response? We have to sing that song in response. I know we can be forgiven, God, for not knowing all of this about ice and what it says about you. But now we know a little bit. And if we wanted to engage in a little discipleship and deeper spiritual practice. We could go and watch a documentary on it or do some reading, listen with um, God-imaging ears and look with uh, God-attentive eyes for evidence of your presence, of your providence, of your love, of your grace, of your goodness in the physical structures and nature of ice. So thank you now that we know for making what we now know a little bit more about. And yeah, as we skate on it next week and as we, we walk on the sidewalk covered with it next month and as we engage ice in all the ways we do in our lives, let those moments be uh, 
uh, triggers, pointers, reminders of your everywhere presence. And help us see your face reflected there, we pray. Amen. Today we actually have two songs of response. One is the uh, creation theme song that John mentioned, but the, uh, the first is actually one that I think maybe even more aptly captures some of the beauty found in ice and in winter. So would you rise and worship with me? Like the low in the sun, and as you gaze, I am blinded in the light of your brightness. Like the fights in the snow, I'm renewed in your warmth. Melt the ice of this wild soul till the bell.
like a seed you were sown for the same color of your soul from Bethlehem so young grew Calvin's Echoia Thanks Dan and thanks for the uh Two pictures of Glenmore Reservoir Ice that Dan took that we have been shamelessly using on every social media platform and PowerPoint show this week. Uh, just the way the light played on those pieces, simple pieces of ice, pieces of art that he held up to the sun and saw all of this glory and color there. All right, uh, before we wrap up for the day, um, uh, just, uh, I guess we always mention, you know, if you want to give and support this church, you can do that um, here. There's a little box in the back. Uh, most people are doing that live, um, so that that's still true every week. But we kind of did a few extra asks last fall, and uh, thousands and thousands of dollars came from places we didn't know, uh, online people in, in the States and from different places. So uh, I don't know how that all adds up yet. Tara probably does, but we're not going to ask for an official report. But um, that was just such providential timing right there. I have resources that you don't know about, God says, through stuff like that. So we continue to go forward in faith uh, to build our little church. And I think the Omicron is going to go fast. And a month from now, we might be in a totally different place in terms of being able to breathe more easy in every way. So anyway, thank you for the giving and support and for being part of this church in other ways, supporting with volunteering. I mean, there are people who stand behind the tech, you know, all those free links back there um, every week uh, without fail. Uh, there are people who help in uh, sustaining the, the tenants in our building, um, people who install lights and do all kinds of work uh, in behind the scenes to, to build our little church. So, so that we should be thankful for, too. Okay, so let's stand uh, for a blessing, and then we're going to sing one more song after that, and we're going to make it clear, like last time, everyone started leaving after the blessing. Hey, we have one more song. Don't leave us. Let's stand, please. For God's blessing. May the grace of God, your heavenly Father, and the light and the life and the ice-speaking uh, wisdom imbuing truth of his son Jesus Christ the grace of Christ and the power and world sustaining world holding presence of the Holy Spirit be with abide with and go with you with us all amen God of creation there at the start before the beginning of time No point of reference Spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonders of light And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born And the vapor of your breath The planets form if the stars were made to worship so